Exodus 33, and I'm going to read from verse 12 to Exodus 34, verse 9. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but have you not let me know whom you will send with me? Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, as God, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we might distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please, show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. <coughs> And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were there on the first tablet, which you broke. Be ready by the morning, and come up in the morning. And, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you, and let no one be seen throughout all the mountains. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first. And he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers of the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found favour in your sight, O Lord, Please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. Thank you, Lord, for your word. It's beautiful to us. For me, this is, this is personally one of my favorite passages in Scripture, because Moses is one of my favorite people. But it is one of the most mysterious, powerful, and amazing passages of Scripture. What was happening on that mountain? Can we even be, I can say to ourselves, let's use our imagination and try and understand what's going on. Can we even use our imagination to try and paint a picture of the glory and the wonder of that moment? You have the finite and the mortal encountering the eternal and the infinite. The man, Moses, encountering the omniscient and omnipotent God Almighty. You have this man, Moses, encountering the center of all meaning and all reality. The one who holds every atom of the entire cosmos together by his word alone. This is all on another scale. 
so that if this man Moses was even to see Yahweh's face, if there were to be other people on the mountain, if there were animals that should even come close, they would invariably be destroyed in the presence. I mean, what we're talking about here is power in a dimension that makes black holes seem like novelty fireworks. In fact, comparison is meaningless at this stage because we, we are dealing with two different kinds of, of, of reality. We're talking about finite, in, we're talking about finite and, and mortal, and we're talking about infinite, eternal. He holds the stars in his hands and calls them by his name. And when I, when I reflect on this image, I'm reminded that this very same God who had to hide Moses in the cleft of a rock and had to make sure there were no animals, no people near him is the very same God who died on a cross for me. Who died on a cross for you. He enters into this world, takes on human form and receives the punishment for my sin, for your sin, removing our sin, removing our guilt, removing our shame, so that we, you and I, can stand confidently in the presence of this God, Hallelujah. bearing His righteousness, so that you and I would know, that you and I would know not this hand which hides us, but the arms of the Father which holds us. To be called his child, to experience his love, to know his pure and everlasting perfect love, and to be called his friend, this God. The intimacy and the relationship that you and I had received through Jesus Christ. The access that you and I have to the one who causes mountains to tremble. He has crafted us, you and me, we've been crafted in His image. The Bible says that we are His masterpiece. We are His poem. Made, crafted by His, the, the, the Bible wants us to try and get an understanding of a craftsman shaping us intimately like a, like a sculptor works with a piece of clay. That's how intimate the great God who causes mountains to tremble deals with us. He, to draw us close so that you and I would reign with Him. The awe of this love. The awe of this grace. The awe of God that makes His intimate. It is this awe of God. This awe of God that makes His intimate, self-giving love for us so stunning. And sometimes I wonder if in our charismatic 21st century, 20th century church, we have turned God into a motivational speaker who loves us. A supplier of gifts. But we're talking about all. And this all of love so wonderfully redefines everything about us. This all of this love redefines who I am, how I see you, how I see this world, how I see my fears, how I see my anxiety, how I see the future. It's all changed when I see the all of this love. I was reading through, I prayed through the Psalms and one of the psalms that I was praying through a couple of weeks ago was Psalm 147, and it has this kind of strange combination. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear Him, in those whose hope, in, who hope in His steadfast love. Fear and steadfast love. The Bible doesn't have a problem to put those two together because we're talking about the all of the one who loves us. The all. Of the one who reaches out to us. How did, we, how, did, how did Moses get to this place? 
where we started today in Exodus 33. How did, he, how did he get to this place? Well, the preceding chapters tell us about the disaster of the golden calf, the idolatry that demonstrated a rejection of Yahweh. An idolatry that demonstrates a rejection of Yahweh. And the consequence is that God says he's going to do something quite interesting. I don't know if you've ever noticed this if you've read Exodus 32. God is going to give his people their inheritance. Because he's a covenant keeping God. Because he's a God that keeps his promises. But he's going to give it to them. He's going to give them their inheritance without him. I'm going to give you your inheritance, but I'm not coming with you. They're going to get the milk and the honey, but they're not going to get God. God is going to bless the Israelites without an ongoing relationship. But Israel, despite the bad press they generally get in the Old Testament, have a moment of sanity and say, no, we, we, we don't want that without you. If we don't have Yahweh, we lose our identity. Moses says, is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct? I am your people from every other people on the face of the earth. If you are not with us, Yahweh, everything, we will, we will lose all understanding of ourselves and we will have no meaning. If you don't go with us, Yahweh, we might have our inheritance, we might have our portion, but we will lose who we are. We'll lose our purpose, lose our meaning. And Yahweh, if you do not go with us, we won't have rest or peace. It will be us keeping it going. It will be us trying to protect it. It will be us trying to make it work. If you are not with us, Yahweh, there is no joy in our inheritance. No, our inheritance and our blessings are nothing, Yahweh, if you don't come with us. When I was thinking about this, it made me think of the athlete who wins the Olympic gold and then finds emptiness on the other side of the finish line. The business person who keeps on buying one more company, making one more big deal, but actually never being satisfied, never, never enough. Or the actor who gets the big hit movie, but then doesn't know how to live in the space that all that fame brings. Or the pastor who builds a big church and a successful ministry, only to find that he doesn't actually believe what he teaches. Because somewhere along the line, he left Jesus to lay hold of his dream, which he wrapped up in spiritual language called calling. But somehow Jesus was lost, forgotten, outside of the promises. But Moses is a like that. He knows that he desperately, desperately needs God. Maybe it's just the failures that he went through. There would be so much part of his life. Maybe it's a deep sense of inadequacy that 40 years of being sidelined in a dead-end job looking after your father-in-law's sheep in the middle of nowhere. When I read the story of Moses, it is like God allowed everything in him to be lost. So that there was space to fill him with the huge measure of grace that he needed for the task ahead. There is something of desperation in Moses. I mean, there's something of an audacity in him. The way I read it, it's like almost for a moment, it's almost like Moses saying, ah, like, like Jacob wrestled with God before the inheritance. It's almost like Moses saying, I'm not going anywhere without you. You can take me out, I don't care, I need you. I mean, God, I want to see you. Who is man? Who is man? Who are you and I to ask God if we could see him? But you know what? I think God actually desires and seeks an audacity in you and me. He seeks an audacity for you and I to reach out to him, to want him passionately. 
to know our need. And you know, the funny thing about this Moses is that this, he's seen some quite incredible things in his life. I mean, he's seen the burning bush, and that was a kind of like some modern form of vandalism in the desert. He sees the burning bush and a voice, and it's holy ground. He sees the plagues, and this incredible thing is somehow, by God's grace, he's in control of them. He touches things, they turn to blood. He says, stop, they stop. He has seen the miraculous. He's gone to the Red Sea, and he has seen the waters open, and the people of God walk through, and the waters, and he's heard the sound of the crushing of the waters of the people of Pharaoh. He has seen incredible things. And I mean, we would all dine out forever on those experiences. Get on the TV show. Write the blogs. Yes, you should have seen Pharaoh's eyes when, when the river turned to blood. Oh, yes, I remember the sound of the, of the waters falling on, uh, on the Pharaoh's, uh, Pharaoh's uh, uh, army. And we would, we would live on a past revelation. We would live on past victories that we've seen, past things that we've seen of God. But Moses isn't satisfied. He wasn't going to. Or he couldn't rely on an old revelation to sustain him for the task ahead. He couldn't rely on an old revelation as a result of a journey at a place he'd never been before. Show me your glory, God, so I can make it and do what you have called me to do. This week, the reason why we left Mark Moses sitting outside at the prayer meeting on the Thursday is because we went to a, um, a talk by a guy called Mark Sayers, who's an Australian guy. Brilliant. If you listen to some of his podcasts, he's written the book, um, Unanxious Presence, which Graham um, has on, on his book table. I haven't forgotten the other book, Graham, don't worry. Um, but he says this, he says um, that... Where we find ourselves now is not at the end of an era or in the beginning of a new era, but we're finding ourselves in this gray, confusing space between the eras. There's enough of the past which is familiar to us, but there's new things happening which we can't understand or interpret, and it's disorientating. It's funny, like I found that when I went to South Africa in February, I hadn't been in South Africa for 10 years, and I walked in around there, and there was enough of my old hometown for me to say, yeah, I, I know this place, but it had changed so substantially, and new things were happening, I thought to myself, I feel like a stranger in my own memories. And that's where we find ourselves now. We are faced with things which we can't even begin to understand. Artificial intelligence. Geopolitical changes that are off the charts and moving so quickly. Identity questions. There are these, all these things and many others in quick succession are knocking over everything we've lent on for understanding or rational. And we're not going to be able to navigate this space or for revelation of Jesus from 20 years ago. No matter how wonderful it was. No matter how amazing it was. We're not going to, it's not going to satisfy us to go on a revelation of 20, 30 years ago. We need to see him here in our present. We cannot navigate the future with programs and plans and human wisdom. We need him. We need a now relationship with our God. We need a now revelation. We need an audacity and a desperation for him. We cannot navigate this future based on a fading memory of the God we knew. What is this revelation that God gives Moses? The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding, steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. 
This is a beautiful self-revelation with an emphasis on mercy, grace, forgiveness, and love, love, love. And the mention of justice is a product of his love because he loves his creation and he's thoroughly committed to bring, calling it to rights, to bring it back, to destroy the things that are trying to destroy the things he loves. And he will deal with evil and injustice. In short, Yahweh is abounding in covenant love and abounding in covenant faithfulness. He is so full of love, so full of mercy, so full of forgiveness, we can't even begin to comprehend him. And Job says, but we have seen but the outer fringes of your works. We have seen but the outer fringes of his works. And he is thoroughly committed to every promise. No matter how dark it seems. No matter how dark the darkness seems. No matter how broken things look. And no matter how strong the evil look. And no matter how strong the injustice look. He is committed to finishing his promises. Amen. And he will finish what he has started. Amen. And that phrase, abounding in covenant love and covenant faithfulness, can also be expressed in another way. It can be described like this. Full of grace and truth. Now listen to these words from the Gospel of John. And do you hear echoes of Exodus? And what we're looking at today. John writes and says this. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Just like Moses, you know that the sense of show me your glory. We have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. Full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's hand. He has made him known to us. Funny that phrase, full of grace and truth. Sometimes the way that word is used is that the truth portion of that is like the hard hand of a silk glove. Like, full of grace, but remember there's truth. And I'm going to flipping hit you around the head because you don't believe. Like, here's grace, but remember there's truth here. Talk gently, carry a big stick. But actually, that word truth is abounding in covenant faithfulness. Jesus is the demonstration he's been true to who he is. True to his promises. True to his perfection. True to everything he is. He's come full of grace and truth. Abounding in covenant love and abounding in covenant faithfulness. That doesn't mean that, that there's no objective truth in the world at all. But that's just not what this passage is emphasizing. This passage is emphasizing that this Jesus who revealed himself to us on the cross. Is the God who's abounding in covenant love and abounding in covenant faithfulness. In Jesus we have seen this God. And through Jesus we have access to him. In ways we can't even begin to imagine. In Hebrews chapter 12, I'm doing all my favorite passages today. In Hebrews chapter 12, they show this contrast between a mountain of smoke. Let me read it to you. It's worth it. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further message be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. We're talking Exodus here. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come. That's not where we've come. We've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels and festival gatherings, 
and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, the spirit of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to be sprinkled blood, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. That, when we gather together today, we might not look spectacular, some of us might, some of us don't, but we might not look spectacular. We might not have the most fizz bang smoke machines, the most funky band, sorry Ruben, you're more funky than me, but the most funky band in the world. We may not have every, but you know what, when as people gather, we are in the most awesome place. Amen. We are the place where there are thousands upon thousands of angels, with the righteous made perfect, with God himself. That's why we gather. That's the access you and I have. As we first face moments, confusion, uncertainty, trials, opportunities, as we do that, we need a revelation of God. Abounding in covenant love and covenant faithfulness, full of grace and truth. You know, all the work that we, we have been blessed over the last three, four years to be able to really do amazing work with the community. And some of you have heard my vision my, of the metaphor of being an Abbey. But none of that, none of that matters. If at the very center of what we are and who we are is not this God who loves us with such all. We have nothing. We have an inheritance without God. And who would want that? Who would want an inheritance? Who would want a blessing without God? It is he who is with us. The one who is among us is mighty to save. Please, God, show us your glory.